I built my dream web app using Rust as the only programming language. And I'm gonna talk about whether I regret that decision, whether you should build your next web app using the same stack. I'm gonna talk about some decisions I made during the project that I wound up regretting and took a 180 on. And I'm gonna talk about five main lessons that I learned from this project. Now this app is a progressive web app, which means it's usable in the web browser and it's also installable on mobile devices like on iOS. It relies heavily on language model inference. And by language model inference, I mean, we're giving some text to a language model and we're getting a result back. One of the basic premises of the app is the user changes their data in some way and then we'll proactively go off and do some inference on their data and save it to a database in case the user wants to look at it later. So this application has two main components. One is the web application, which is what users are interacting with when they use the application through the browser or on their mobile device. The other is like a worker node and that actually pulls messages off of a queue does some computation, and then writes the result to the database. Those are the two main components. I use AWS ECS, Elastic Container Service, to host both those worker nodes and the web application. In the case of the web application, those ECS containers are behind an ALB, an application load balancer. The ALB actually accepts the user traffic and distributes it equally across all the web app nodes. I use AWS SQS to manage the queue that the worker nodes pull from. So the web app, based on something that the user does, it'll push a message to the queue. The worker nodes will pull that off the queue, do the work, and then write it to the database. The application makes heavy use of WebSockets. So we have these long running, potentially long running computations. If the user's on a page in the web application where the result of that computation is relevant, we'd wanna let the, the web application know the computation's done as soon as possible, updating the page basically proactively instead of having, the, having to have the client pull. We use WebSockets for that between the web app and the user's browser. To notify the web app that a computation's done, we use Redis messaging. AWS Elasticache has a Redis compatible API. So in the cloud, I actually use Elasticache for that same purpose. Now the things that I went outside AWS for. Database. I was a huge fan of AWS DynamoDB. I actually started the project with DynamoDB. It did not make sense for this project. DynamoDB was never going to work. I don't know why I thought it would. That is one of the biggest mistakes I made for this project. DynamoDB has far too many constraints on what you can do with your schema and how flexible querying is. It just doesn't work for this project. This, this project is a SQL database project through and through. And unfortunately, I waited a little bit too long to realize that, but I did eventually. And so I migrated from DynamoDB to CockroachDB. AWS does have SQL offerings. They do have AWS Aurora, AWS RDS. Uh, there's a new one called AWS DSQL, which is more similar to CockroachDB. Their existing offerings, Aurora and RDS, they don't automatically shard your data like DynamoDB does, right? So if your data becomes larger than a single node can handle, it does not automatically distribute that data equally across X number of nodes. DSQL, I think, is going to be able to do that. It's more like CockroachDB in that sense. At the time I was looking into it, it was still in preview and it did not have feature parity with something like Cockroach or Yugabyte or any of these other competitors. So I went with CockroachDB and I've been very happy with it so far. The other AWS service that I tried to use was AWS Bedrock and I was not happy with it. <laughs> A lot of the models don't have good support for tool use. The prices are not competitive. Yeah, I was not a fan of Bedrock. I ditched it pretty quickly and I went to Hugging Face Inference Providers, which is a very new product. You probably heard of Hugging Face. They are the central repository for open language models, already a well-known name. You can choose from basically a marketplace of inference providers. Without making any code changes, I can switch between different inference providers like Grok, Cerebras, Samba Nova, Novita, Hyperbolic, Together AI, Fireworks AI, all these providers are on there, which is amazing. And so you can switch to whatever one best suits your use case, or whichever one has the best pricing, so on and so forth. Hugging Face Inference Providers is shaping up to be a great product. I'm very happy with it so far. One of my biggest mistakes, I, I went into this thinking that I was going to self-host the language models. And the reason I thought I was going to self-host the language models is because I thought the small language models, like the 8 billion parameter Llama 3.1, 8 billion parameter language model was going to be sufficient for my application's use case. And it was not even close. If you compare language models by asking them questions, so you have Llama 3.18b over here, you have DeepSeek R1 over here. If you ask them trivia questions, how far is the moon from the earth? Their answers are gonna be roughly similar. The small model is gonna look like it's very capable relative to this huge model. When you start introducing instruction following and agentic tasks, 
they become very different very quickly. The small model will start just doing weird stuff and just be completely incapable of doing what you're asking it. The small models will fit easily into an NVIDIA GPU that you can get on AWS. The larger models, like they're very, very difficult to self-host. And so I thought I was gonna self-host this thing, no problem. I can't do that yet. The other reason inference providers are nice is that you can do a bunch of inference requests in parallel. If one user action might kick off like 50 inference requests, as is the case with this application, inference providers are amazing for this uh, because you can do those 50 inference requests immediately. Async Rust was amazing for this project. Another big mistake, trying to build my own web-based rich text editor. There are a number of these available in the JavaScript ecosystem. There's one called Quill, there's one called TipTap. And I thought I was gonna have some features that required my own rich text editor. Building a text editor is more work than it sounds. It's feasible, but it's not something you wanna do if you don't have to. So I started out with TipTap, I ditched TipTap, I started building my own Markdown-based text editor, and I quickly realized that this was not something I was going to be able to tackle for this project. It was not realistic, so I switched back to TipTap. When I say this project is, I use Rust as the only programming language, yes, that's true. I am using a JavaScript library for the actual text editing ex experience. E everything else I'm using is all Rust. Okay, lessons I learned. First of all, AI-assisted coding. It is not good enough to replace software developers yet. Humans have for whatever reason, have a unique capacity to understand and maintain context of large code bases, which is something that these AI tools cannot do yet. One place that AI was extremely helpful for me, I, I used it a lot, but mostly for like question answering. Like, am I doing this right? Or what does this Tailwind CSS class do in this context? Things like that, it was amazing for. I don't think I had it write a ton of code. The one place that I did have it write a ton of code is when I was transitioning from DynamoDB to CockroachDB. That transition probably would have taken a week if I didn't have AI. With AI, it took about, about two days, roughly, which is amazing. So it was very helpful for that. I also learned that self-hosting might not be a viable option in the future. Language model inference providers are building custom chips that make inference way faster than anything in a current generation NVIDIA chip can do. Shining examples of this are Cerebrus and Grok. They use custom chips and their inference speed is extremely fast. It makes me wonder if self-hosting is going to be a viable option going forward. It would be if we can get similar chips on AWS or other cloud providers. It may be the case that self-hosting just isn't a viable option anymore. Time will tell. The third one is small language models seem really good when you're asking them questions. I mentioned this already. They seem really good when you're asking them questions. They break down very quickly when you start to give them instructions or set them off on agentic tasks. That was a hard lesson to learn. Number four, Rust and Leptos are absolutely viable for building web applications. Are they for everybody? No. If you're already familiar with Rust and you need to build a web application, go for it. If you're not familiar with Rust, it might not be the best option, especially if you have a tight deadline. If you are extremely familiar with Rust or you don't have a tight deadline, go for it. There's very little reason not to. My one complaint with Leptos is the view macro syntax can get a little verbose. Uh, I don't know if anything is going to be done about that or if it's even feasible or if it aligns with the charter of the project. I don't know. I would like to see it get a little more concise. Long story short, Leptos, great web framework. The fifth and final lesson is achieve the original vision of the project before you tackle features that you like thought of on a whim and get really excited about. I had this feature called annotations. I won't go into what it exactly was, but it was something I thought about on a whim and I got really, really excited about it. And so I ditched all my work for the preceding week. I spent all this time on it and ultimately realized it was not conducive to a good user experience. It was a cool feature, but it made things very cumbersome in a way that I could tell users were not gonna like. So I just pulled it out. So I, I wasted like two or three weeks of work. What I should have done is kind of mold it over longer, achieve the original vision of the project, and then maybe by that time I would have realized that it was a bad idea or I would have been happy with the project as it is. I don't know. But yeah, implementing features that you think of on a whim, usually a bad idea. That is a stream of consciousness kind of post-mortem on this project. The project's not done. It is in a beta state. If you're interested in beta testing or you wanna know more about the project, um, I put a link to a newsletter in the description of the video. 
sign up for the newsletter. I also put a link to a Discord server, not the Code to the Moon Discord server, but a Discord server specifically for this app. You can go in there, ask questions. Other than that, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.